morning. Last week we finished uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Am I correct? So that was, well, starting in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Peter speaking here. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So we find Peter focusing in on the Christ. Again, we're at Pentecost. We are explaining the uh, activities that are going on, which appear chaotic to the casual observer, with all of these people speaking in languages that they didn't know yesterday, but now they're fluent in these different languages, sharing the good news about Jesus of Nazareth being the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so Peter is talking to these Jews specifically, reminding them of their crime uh, in murdering this Messiah. And so he spends a verse about the life of Jesus, a verse about the death of Jesus, as now he's going to go nine verses about the resurrection. So the focus of this sermon Peter is preaching is certainly on the resurrected Christ. And that begins, that focus begins now in verse 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, and that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Father, we pray your blessings upon your word this morning as we contemplate the truth and reality of the resurrection. May we be encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, as we begin on verse 24, any questions from last week? All right, so as we turn in the sermon from Peter, he's explaining how, yes, you, you killed Jesus. He was crucified. That is fact. But God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death. Um, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Not possible for Jesus to be held by the grip of death. Uh, of course, we can digest that probably pretty easily in reconciling the fact that Jesus was God, and so he had an, an advantage <laughs> in that regard. Um, Just a little bit of it, yeah, uh, but, you know, technically speaking, it was God the Father that raised him from the dead. Um, and so that is... The Holy Spirit is, raised him, right? Is a critical... Hmm, that, that's, a, that's a fascinating question. Uh, the scriptures I'm thinking of refer to the Father. So I'm going to stick with the Father raised him from the dead. Not that I fully understand that. I'm just going to stick with the subject-verb agreement in the verses that I'm thinking about. Um, But certainly, you know, the Spirit of God, you know, and how how that all works, uh, I I can't explain it. Um, But God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And and that uh, would signify 
maybe a bunch of things, but at least one thing comes to my mind. What, what would the Father raising Jesus from the dead signify to you? Pardon me? Yes, yeah, he was dead, dead, for real dead, and it took God raising him. Yes, death is, is agonizing. It is painful. Um, <clears throat> interesting. Pardon me? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, I, so I was just saying you can just verify that it was completed. And... Yes, and, and so along the lines of the verification... I'm thinking of the word approval or satisfaction. The Father said, okay, you know, Jesus said it's finished, but God, the Father raising him from the dead is declaring, okay, it's a done deal. Isn't that fulfilling the prophecy? Yeah. All kinds of prophecy fulfilled. Um, and we see the approval of what Christ did. God the Father putting his stamp of approval saying, you did it. I accept it. Your sacrifice is complete. Now I'm raising you from the dead. So uh, there is this acceptance and approval from God the Father as he raises Jesus from the dead. Um, you know, Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Um, so that's a clue about uh, death not being able to hold him. Uh, in John chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, he was telling them, hey, uh, destroy this temple and I'll uh, raise it again in three days. And they're like, it took us 46 years to build this temple. When are you going to build it in three days? Of course, he was talking about his body as a temple. Um, and so there was the promise of that. And then uh, Jesus promised us that because he lives, we also will live. And so there is the promise of the resurrection that because he's no longer in the grave, that we as his followers uh, are going to be resurrected to eternal life as well. Um, now, he goes, again, remember a couple weeks ago we looked and Peter was referencing the Old Testament. Again, re remember, he's talking to the Jews, so they're familiar with the Old Testament. So I love how he is tailoring his sermon to the audience, right? So we should always think about Okay, my neighbor that I'm talking to, my coworker I'm talking to, what's their background? What's their upbringing? What do they understand? Let me use analogies and word pictures that they can relate to. Is it a fisherman? Uh, can I use some sort of fishing analogy so that they can connect these truths? Um, but he's talking to Jews, and they know the Old Testament, and he, by being inspired by the Spirit, remember two weeks ago I said, the Spirit is always amplifying and clarifying the scriptures. We're not saying something new. We're taking what God has said in the word, presenting it to people, and the script and the spirit is enlightening the mind and the eyes to understand and see the truth. And so that's what Peter's doing. He's going back. He says, well, you remember what David said. Of course they do. David was great. Of course we remember what he said in Psalm 16. He said, well, yeah, let's just read it together cross-reference here is we make the main point about Jesus being resurrection. Um, David said this, right? Uh, and he quotes Psalm 16, but he, he says in verse 29, um, now let's, we've read it, now let's uh, uh, interpret. Uh, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, whom we both love, uh, the Jews that he's preaching to and Peter himself, that two things are true. One, he died. Yep. Don't see him anymore. And he was buried. Yes. And that tomb that he was buried in, it's still there. And he's still there. Right? Right. So, that brings us to a conclusion, right? David was saying it, but he's dead and buried. His body did decay. He did not resurrect. He's no longer the king, no longer with us. So, verse 30, being therefore a prophet... David was a prophet, yes, king and a prophet, and knowing, David knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, yeah, he remembered what God told him, that he was going to have someone on the throne in his family <clears throat> forever, and specifically it was going to culminate in the Messiah. Verse 31, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. 
I'm telling Peter saying, I'm telling you, when David was saying this and writing it down, he was prophetically talking about Jesus. The Spirit of God led him to write these things because this is what was going to occur with the Messiah. And Jesus was not abandoned to Hades. Hades is the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament Sheol, which it can specifically refer to hell, but this is a general reference to just the, the place of the dead, the abode of the dead, um, that idea. And so not that Christ was going to be abandoned to hell, but that Christ was going to be left dead. He was not abandoned uh, to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. He was resurrected. He did not decay this Jesus, again, a repeat from verse 24, God raised from the dead. Uh, and so, again, Brooke, I would say this one uh, against God, that word for God, referencing God the Father, saying God the Father raised him up uh, there in verse 32. This Jesus, God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. And so, just the concrete evidence of David died and is in the tomb. Jesus died and is not. And we all saw him. We saw him be crucified. We saw him resurrected. We have interacted with him. You killed him. God raised him up. So it's so powerful. And it's so um, black and white. It's like there's no debate. Peter's just standing there proclaiming, I agree. This is a high energy, high emotion scenario here today. We have reporting live at Pentecost events, but it's very explainable. And you want to explain it with, with people being drunk because, again, it's confusing to them, Brooke. Their eyes are clouded. They're dark. They don't see. But to Peter, who's been enlightened, he's like, it all makes sense. Let me draw from this Old Testament scripture. Let me draw from this Old Testament scripture. Let me draw from this prophecy. Let me show you. Let me connect the dots through the Spirit of God, making this all clear. He just lays out this clear sermon like, guys, it's been written the whole time, and it's just been fulfilled in our very presence today. This is what's happening. The culmination, the Messiah has come, lived, died, resurrected, and is now at the right hand of God. And this is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, he is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. He is the subject of all these prophecies. He is the one in whom you must repent and believe. I mean, we're just so much packed in there. I mean, he just takes a few paragraphs to sum it up. I, I just can't imagine how crazy it is to be there on this day with the Spirit of God moving like this. And Peter just stands up and proclaims in a loud voice, uh, here's the explanation. And it's pretty simple, but hard to believe. You know, you've, you've got this one day's event, but you've got thousands of years of, you know, looking and reading and thinking and hoping for the Messiah. And now... All of a sudden, boom, here it is, laid out, plain as day, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the way of life. He is the path to life. He is the resurrection and the life himself. Thoughts? Going away, it makes sense because... Uh because of our belief in him, we'll never die. That's right. Ever. You are his. He has bought you with a price. He's going to glorify you, and you will be with him forever. And, and Peter is not just making this up in his own brain. Right. Right. He's proven it with something that's been written for a long time. He's like, look, I, I'm not drunk. In fact, I've got enough sense early in the morning to go back to the scriptures, the academic books, turn to page X, let's read it together, here's what it says, and read along with me as I read aloud, this is Jesus. Okay, yeah. He would have never been able to open his mouth until that happened. 
Right. Well, you know, what's amazing is if you read the prophecies in the Old Testament from Isaiah and everything, and you see about what Jesus is doing and the prophecies that are being fulfilled, pretty amazing stuff. Pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, for and how sure. can you even think about denying it? You know, you're seeing the Old Testament. Yeah. That's what confuses me. Well, you know, going back to that confusion, and, and Romans chapter 1 talks about how unbelievers suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They turn the stereo up so loud that they can't hear anything else. They stay so busy with so much other stuff that they don't have time to think about these things that you're talking about. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness because they don't want to face the music. They don't want to face the reality. That's what I was thinking when you guys were talking about, that it is not an innocent blindness. No. They're yes. Yeah, it's an active Rebellion, for sure, for sure. Well, you know, it's a pride thing. Yes, yes, and from the beginning, it's a pride thing. And that's why God hates pride, man. Yeah, hates pride cometh he before a fall, yes. So, you know, there's also good gospel news in Psalm 16. You know, David, these things certainly applied to David as well. I mean, and David... Um, you know, had relationship with the Lord and his heart was glad and his tongue, you know, uttered words um, and he did dwell in hope because of uh, of having relationship with Christ um, and and God did make known to him paths of life and, and did make him full of gladness in his presence and we can have those things as well. As Christ's followers, we can be full of hope in life's adversities. And, and we see ultimately to Christ. Christ was on the road to Calvary. He, he knew the cross lay ahead of him, but God filled him with hope. In fact, Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And so God is able to fill us up with joy such that even in the most difficult circumstances, Jesus called us to carry our cross. And in carrying our cross this side of heaven, living for Jesus, God can fill us with so much joy that our neighbors think, wow, your life looks so hard and difficult, yet you're full of joy. Why is that? Because the Spirit of God putting the joy of your salvation within your heart. And so this is good gospel news for us as His followers as well as we see the resurrected Christ being presented in Peter's sermon there on Pentecost. Father, thank you for the gospel that we find in your word week in and week out. We pray that you would secure it to our hearts, that you would fill us with hope. In Jesus' name, amen.